Welcome to Conversations with David Ibarra. Today we have as our guest the Honorable Rocky Anderson, my friend, 33rd Mayor of Salt Lake City, and two terms. Welcome, Rocky. Great to be with you, David. Thank you. Great. I'd like to start by sharing with our audience a little bit about you, your history. Well, I've done a lot in my life. I, most of my life has been here in Utah. I did go to law school in Washington, D.C. Uh, but I really take pride in the fact that I worked really hard at a lot of manual jobs, got to know a lot of working people in my life and saw the struggles that they have. Uh, I, I, I worked as a, a lumber truck driver. I built trusses, delivered cabinets, was a bartender, worked at a methadone clinic, built buck fence on a ranch. I shingled roofs. Uh, I felt like I got such a great exposure to so many different people that I otherwise would not have known and I would not have gained an understanding about. And that's really a lot of what's driven what I've done since in my life, a sense that what we're given in life, we owe a lot back. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to do what I can to change things for the better and primarily for those who may not have a lot of power or wealth or capacity to change their own circumstances. Great. If I uh, recall right, uh, one of those jobs was even a yellow cab driver. That's right. I was right? a cab driver. So is yep. that what helped you to understand exactly where to get from uh, all around this city? <laughs> so that when you went canvassing and knocking on doors, you knew the city? I did know the city. And, and I was also a waiter. I mean, I, they, I had so much diverse experience working those kinds of jobs. And then I started graduate school and decided that's going to be way too passive for what I want to do in life. And that's when I decided to go into law mm -hmm. because I saw law as a real opportunity to stand up for people's rights and to fight for greater justice. Now, you had a uh, heck of a career in a law, but you decided to leave it at the peak of your success and do what? Well, I did. I, I left in for one year and campaigned for Congress. And I, I had a bloody primary race, and it was this classic fight between people in the Democratic Party, between you know whether you've got to be a Utah mm -hmm. conservative or you're going to stand up for your principles. Mm -hmm. And uh, I won that primary by a long shot, and then I lost the general election and looking back on it, everybody recognized it's because in 1996, which was really early at the time, I stood up for marriage equality, mm -hmm. regardless of sexual orientation. Now it's a given. Right. Now it's accepted right. around most of the world and certainly across our country. And so that is such a great example of the kind of progress we can make when people will stand up and fight for what they believe is right. And it all starts by having a conversation and, and bringing it up when others are saying, what? And then it sees the idea of, hey, is this, am I right or am I wrong? And they have to think. Who was your opponent uh, during that race? Well, the, the Democratic primary was Kelly Atkinson, mm -hmm. and then it was Merrill, Merrill Cook in the so you General lost election. to uh, Merrill Cook, Mr. Personality. <laughs> Just joking. I did, but it, the core of his campaign was about yes, the, the marriage equality thing. And now, if you look back, you'd say, this guy was a total dinosaur. Yeah. Because, of course, we all stand yeah. up for equality sure. without regard sure. to sexual orientation. It's sometimes it just takes leadership. But you know what you said a minute ago? It reminds me. Of, of a statement that I saw recently that when one person will stand up and say, hey, this isn't right, it helps empower other people to stand up and say the same thing. And then ultimately, you all can make a difference together yeah. just by taking a stand. Well, I can tell you something, Rocky. There's something that, uh, uh, you know, I like to believe that I lead from a... Uh, 
a positive state of mind. But the one thing that I have learned from you, and no kidding aside, is that sometimes you have to be very vocal and loud and to the point, or people just don't hear you. Not only that, but sometimes you have to criticize. Sometimes you have to take people on. And if you think that it's wrong, you need to stand up and point it out. And don't be afraid about rocking the boat. If we don't rock the boat during our lives, in my view, what, what were our lives about? It's the heart of our democracy. It was supposed to be about conversations in pubs and uh, cafes and uh, talking about what we believed as a nation, having these difficult, uh, crucial conversations, and then coming to a consensus without getting into hate. Boy, it doesn't seem like we're in that place right now. No, today. certainly aren't. But there, you know, there, there have been periods, and certainly even in the beginning, we mm-hmm. talk about the founders as if they were one entity and they were all on the same page. They weren't. I mean, yeah. you know. That's true. <laughs> Hamilton me. and Aaron Burr, yeah. they went out and had a duel, and it yeah. cost Hamilton his life. Yes, and w- w- what a, g- a great Broadway play. Yeah. That's for sure. Tell me, after you uh, uh, had the experience of running for Congress, you went back to law. Uh, for I did. How long? Uh, it was probably a couple of years, and I, I handled some great cases. I always tried to represent people who suffered because of the abuses of power by others, whether it was corporate entities, whether it was governmental entities where people's constitutional rights were violated, whether it's people defrauding other people, mm-hmm. taking advantage of them. I always found a lot of joy in that. And uh, then I decided I feel so strongly about what I saw going on in this community. I saw a mayor who I thought was totally corrupt. Mm-hmm. And I said, I can't just sit on the sidelines and complain about it. So I ran for mayor and <laughs> David, it, the other side tried to paint me as like, mm-hmm. oh, this ACLU liberal and Planned Parenthood and all that. Well, in Salt Lake City, that actually was in my favor. Mm-hmm. And I won that election by 20%. And I served as mayor for two terms, eight years. And then it was my own choice not to run for a third term. Which uh, most of us believe you would have won easily. I think but, I would have, yeah. but I, mm-hmm. I felt like I rang a lot mm-hmm. out of being mayor. I was on a national and international stage on matters like climate and restorative justice. Well, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that day you uh, called me at the office and, and was sharing with me some uh, national award that Salt Lake City was uh, uh, going to be uh, uh, the the banquet and, and and who had gotten the award or won the award was going to be announced. And, hey, David, why didn't you come to London? <laughs> I think it was like a week notice. And I, I'm like, like, London, are you? Okay, I'll be there. Yep. What a great time. You were what, there. And what, it was what, an international yes. award. What it was, was that? It, it was the World Leadership Award for our envir- wow. environmental programs. Yeah. I, I've been studying the climate issue for decades. Mm-hmm. And uh, people who are paying attention have known that we're in a climate crisis and we all need to act together. And um, I think on these big issues, we all need to come together. It should never be a partisan issue. And, we're and, we're and, all on this planet together, yeah. our children, later generations, yeah. and we all need to look out for each other. And we need to listen to the science and pay attention to the evidence. And you mentioned earlier about the divisions now. A lot of it is because people don't seem to care about the facts and the evidence or the science. Well, if they talk loud enough. Uh, in hearsay or what have you, they think that people will b- uh, believe it. But let me uh, go back a little bit, and I'd like to have you share with the audience some of the things that occurred during the eight years of being mayor, because there were some really huge things that occurred in Salt Lake City from an Olympics and on and on. But tell us about some of those experiences you had as the leader of the capital uh, city of uh, Utah. Uh, during your time as mayor? Well, I I had the pleasure of being the mayor of the 2002 Winter Olympic Games host city. And uh, that was like another 
full-time job, getting prepared for that. Right. Of course, we were concerned about security issues. It was the biggest public event held in this country since 9-11. Mm-hmm. And there had been a lot of threats. Mm-hmm. But I think all of us, uh, including Mitt Romney and the Salt Lake Organizing Committee, I think we pulled it off without a hitch and, and something that our city can be very proud of. Uh, let me, but, let but me for me, for just a, a minute. I, I, you, you, I just want to ask you something. You and Mitt Romney worked together in Harmony? Oh, better than in Harmony. Yeah. We, we worked uh, sometimes on a daily basis. We got along well. We had the same goals. And on a person-to-person level, I enjoyed Mitt Romney and his wife. Both of them have a great sense of humor, and they're far more reasonable, I must tell you, yeah. than the, the, the partisan person who ran for president of the United States saying that corporations are people. You know, uh, problem solving doesn't have anything to do with being a Democrat or a Republican, does it? Not at all. It, it was interesting. <laughs> after you and Mitt ended up working on uh, the 2002 Winter Olympics, if I recall, he went on to run for a governor of Massachusetts, and there was an individual from Salt Lake City that did some of his uh, 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 did some campaign ads for him. Is that not right? I did an ad for him. Uh-huh. Actually, his his crew came into Salt Lake, and I told him I'd be I'd be proud because I don't think it ought to matter what party somebody's with. If you know the person is reasonable, competent, and uh, is going to do the right thing. And I had a lot of Democrats back in Massachusetts angry with me. Yes. But I did this commercial. I'm proud of it. His poll numbers actually changed after that commercial came out, and and he won that election. I'm not saying it was just because of the commercial, but I think it made people think, okay, this can't just be about party affiliation. There you go. And he did a great job for us. I was disappointed that he had to, that he felt like he had to change his views. Right. 180 degrees on a couple of issues (laughs) when he ran for president. Immigration. (laughs) But, uh, well, yeah, immigration, gay and lesbian rights, abortion, uh, because he told me he thinks Roe versus Wade works and we ought to just move on in this country away from those divisions. It was a great example of leadership from both you and me. And, uh, and it wouldn't, it be nice for us to just take a moment in our own, uh, uh, memories and lives and think back to that time when we had that kind of, uh, cooperation that problem solving is problem solving. We got to get back to that, but go ahead and continue I agree. And about some of your mayor, mayoral. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, Mitt Ro- I, I did that commercial for Mitt. He didn't have to do this, but he did one endorsing me for my reelection as yes, mayor. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. How cool is that? And then that was used against him by his Republican opponents yeah. in the primary when he was running for president, which right. I thought was pretty shabby of them. But anyway, I, I, some, of, some of the people that I'll go to lunch with and have great personal relationships are folks that most people would say, how can you even get in the same room with? Your differences are so great. But uh, I've been able to work with people, doesn't matter, party affiliation. You want to get things done, you can always find common ground with people. Well, I'll, I'll say this, and uh, you know, I certainly don't want to uh, 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 be negative, but I, but I got to say this, you know, the folks that I talk to in the legislature and what have you, about you. Some of them, uh, frankly, don't like you much, but you know what they all say? Is I trust that Rocky will do what he said he would do. They believe that after they had a, a conversation, and even though we're coming from different sides, that we could get to a place that Rocky Anderson and us could find a consensus through the uh, rebuild of our downtown with the uh, uh, LDS church being heavily involved. And that today is what's missing with the administration we have in Salt Lake City. The words don't match the action. So, boy, that's something to be really proud of, Rocky. Yeah, well, thank you. And I think when you make promises, whether they're campaign promises or you talk about things after you're elected, you need to go out and do it. Right. 
And don't just be aspirational. And that's where it stops with so many of these people. Look, look at our current mayor in Salt Lake City. I like her a lot personally. But she's talking about, oh, we're going to deal with the homeless issue and we're going to do these great things. The homeless problem in Salt Lake City has never been worse. Never. And I hate to mention this, but there's human excrement and urine Mm -hmm. all over downtown Salt Lake City streets and sidewalks and doorways. These encampments. We got rid of a shelter and put in three millions of dollars worth of of resource centers spread all over the city that are now basically shelters, but with almost 400 fewer beds. So that means we've got all these people out there that we have to scramble around during the winter to find shelters. And a lot of them are shelter resistant. And we, the leadership in this city and our County, and I have to include the County, They don't seem to care about those who are on the streets, homeless, who have mental illness, some of whom end up dying in the freezing cold in the winter because they won't go in these shelters, and they don't get them in for mental health treatment, although they fit the legal standard, which is that you've got to show imminent risk of danger to themselves or other people. If we had somebody walking into a fire, could you not go grab them and keep them from harming themselves? Absolutely. What's the difference between that and the man that I found on the sidewalk in yeah. stocking feet in a wheelchair in eight degree weather? And the police officer said there's nothing he could do. One of our mental health facilities said there's nothing they can do. And our county mayor when I brought this to everybody's attention, said, I didn't know what I was talking about because we have plenty of resource centers. I just think these people need to get out on the street and get out in our city and see for themselves what's really happening. Well, I I tell you what, that, uh, you know, I spend a a lot of my time, as you know, going across this nation, helping people improve leadership. But one of the things that, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's really clear and it, and it's easy to determine how someone is going to lead. Listen what they say, and if they'll uh, uh, quote statistics and try to convince you that things are getting better, they're trying to lower your expectation to match their deliverables so they can call it excellent when it's not excellent at all. It's not even fair. It's poor. And the one thing that I I can uh, say, and then I will move on to another subject, because I really want Erin Mendenhall to be successful, but I'll tell you what, she doesn't show any kind of creativity at all. I hate to say it, but I'm seeing the same thing in terms of county leadership. Yeah. Um, You know, this was interesting. The county mayor issued a, she she put out an order with the head of her health department saying, okay, we're going to mask up in in places of employment in our schools. This is when Mm -hmm. Omicron was surging. People were dying. Our ICUs were full. It was the right thing to do. And then the governor said, I'm going to exempt state buildings and employees. And then the mayor issued a proclamation, issued a letter saying, no, you can't do that. It's my decision. And then she didn't do anything about it. She didn't, I said, why don't you bring a lawsuit? Go into the court. You can get a restraining order. Mm -hmm. If you're right on the law, you could get a restraining order in a day. Mm -hmm. Certainly in a week and protect all these people, the University of Utah and the rest. But as as we all know, talk is easier than walk. And one of the things that you'll never be accused of is not walking your talk. Well, David, you and I, I think that's a lot. I mean, we're great friends But I think one thing we really respect about each other is we never stop with complaining or or talking about what our aspirations are. If we don't get to the point where we're checking off the box and executing, we both understand the rest of it really doesn't Doesn't matter. matter. You know, I got to just add one thank you publicly. I had a uh, client and a friend call me, an automobile dealer, uh, whose uh, daughter 
uh, was uh, going to the uh, University of Utah and had joined a, a sorority uh, uh, and uh, and because she was will in 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 a wheelchair and uh, on, and needed to have uh, a, a wheelchair parking spot, uh, she couldn't get to where she needed to go uh, the uh, sorority house. And I called you and I said, ah, I really hesitated because I don't think I had ever called you our our friendship to ask you for anything uh, at all. But I just thought this 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 father was so hurt and wanted his daughter's experience to be as normal as it could be. So I called you up and I said, hey, Rocky, do you think you could get a uh, handicapped parking uh, space uh, uh, painted next to this address? And you said, well, tell me. Uh, uh, what? Yes. That father called me by the end of the day. You had it done before the end of the day. I'll tell you what, just understanding the feelings of others and doing everything we can to help people have a more enjoyable life experience. That's the things that I'm just so proud of you. Well, Let's, thank you. And, and it needs to be made clear. It wasn't because you called me. Mm-hmm. It's because I saw oh, absolutely. that this had to be done. And, you know, David, it, people have told me during the past couple of administrations in the city they can't get through to the mayor. They can't get a meeting lined up. I said, what do you mean you can't get him? That's her job. And, and we had meetings set up with anybody that wanted to sign up on a regular basis. And we had community meetings where anybody could come yes. and the media would be there, yep. full accountability, full transparency. And that's where we learned about a lot of these yes. things that, that made the job so rewarding in so many ways as we'd find out about issues like that. It's the details. And, and I'd have my department well, heads there and I'd say, you know, you, go out and take care yeah, of it. Let's and, get this done. And, and, and we, and, and then, but you also taught people to not have to, not have to, don't wait to be told if you know it's right, just go do it. But that's servant leadership. Yeah. And that is something that is frankly lacking in our city today. Let's switch and move on, if we could, to uh, tell us a little bit about what you think is the most, uh, in short, uh, 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 answer, because we're coming to the end of our time. What's, what's the biggest, uh, most troubling issues facing our nation, our state today, in your mind? Well, the fundamental problem is that we're not on the same page anymore. We're not dealing with the same facts as an electorate. And you don't have a democracy if you don't have an informed electorate. You know, the whole idea of we the people, that our government comes from we the people. Back in colonial times, it was amazing how seriously people took that, that, hey, it's up to us and the, the kind of debate and people were getting newspapers. Our postal service was delivering newspapers and magazines out into the hinterlands so that everybody could be seeing good information. And now everything is so dissipated. It's hard to carry on a conversation with some people anymore because you're dealing with different universes and half of that universe <laughs> is misinformation that people are so willing to believe because it fits their worldview. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, sometimes it's a very paranoid worldview. Right. So they're going to reject 97% of the scientists right. on climate. They're going to reject almost the entire scientific community on vaccinations mm-hmm. because right. they're me- getting this nonsense yeah. day in and day out on, on social media. Well, I've known you um, uh, since 2000, or uh, just about one, I think, 2001. Uh, we met uh, uh, through my brother, Mickey, uh, during a conversation that the two of you were having about the Olympics. But that's another story I don't want to go into right now. But I want to finish up our program by, I've known you for a long time. And I know this, there isn't no relax. There isn't no go to the bench and <laughs> retire. There is what next for you. and so. Tell the audience, what are you doing now? And make sure we talk about the Justice Party. Okay. Well, after I left 
the mayor's office. I founded and ran a human rights education and advocacy organization. You were kind enough to provide us office space for over three years for that organization. And we, we had great successes, but unfortunately we found ourselves just trying to fund it and spending so much time doing that rather than substantive work. So we started the Justice Party. And the Justice Party is not just another third party where we're interested in winning elections because you don't really make a lot of changes by electing who you think are the right people. You make changes by bringing people together at the grassroots level, educating them, organizing them, and mobilizing them to push for change. And that has been the missing link in our politics. One wonders why, why is it the majority of people in this country want universal health care? We want less incarceration in a country where we have by far the world's highest incarceration rates. We want an end to the war on drugs. We, we want fiscal responsibility so we don't lay off these enormous uh, debt the national debt and, and the deficit spending on later generations. Why is it the majority of people hold these views on those issues and the Republicans and Democrats combined have given us just the opposite? That's what the Justice Party is primarily doing right now is organizing people, building teams all around the country so that we're all pushing together. Anthony Lake told Human Rights Watch advocates when they went to him and said, geez, you got to do something about the genocide in Rwanda. He said, there they are lobbying at the highest levels with all this great reporting. But Anthony Lake said, you've got to make more noise. We need to hear from the people on this. And there was not, amazingly enough, not a grassroots organizing mechanism to get people at the grassroots nationwide to understand what was going on and then to push our elected officials. One senator said if every senator had re received 100 letters from their constituents, there probably would have been a different response by the United States, both in terms of the genocide in Rwanda and the horrific genocide in Bosnia. That's what can make the difference. Like we saw, we, and this isn't just theoretical, it wasn't because of who we elected that we had a successful labor movement, that we had a successful civil rights movement, that we had a successful women's suffrage movement. It's because people who cared, organized, mobilized and demanded change. Well, tell me, where can people learn more about the Justice Party? Well, we've got a, a website and a lot of interactive components. It's at justiceparty.us. Easy to remember, www.justiceparty.us. And uh, we need volunteers. We're going to set up state parties all over the country. And, of course, we need funding. And so, Now, can somebody uh, join the effort of the Justice Party and not leave the party affiliation that they have currently? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that because, you know, to this point, people have looked at politics and their party affiliations as if it's a team sport. Mm -hmm. well, I, you know, it's like being a jazz fan. We love the jazz, and we don't like anybody that plays against them. Republicans and Democrats have done that now for generations. Yes. We tell people, you know, we're trying to be as nonpartisan as possible. Mm -hmm. If you want to remain a Democrat so that you can, you know, you can hedge your mm -hmm. bets in terms of maybe if Trump runs again, mm -hmm. you can do that. But still support the Justice Party in pushing these two parties to bring to the majority of people in this country what we want. That's when we'll have a true yeah, democracy. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you this, uh, Rocky. Now, it also would fit for a Republican that wishes to reshape the Republican Party to some of the same issues that you, the Justice Party believes in, a fiscal responsibility, and also join and be a member 
and stay a member of the Republican Party in case uh, pr- uh, ex-President Trump <laughs> runs. They could still vote for him, but maybe still sh- reshape their party to get back to the um, uh, purpose that it once had. Absolutely. My, my parents were both Republicans. Mm-hmm. They'd probably have a hard time with what's going on today. Right. There are a lot of good, reasonable Republicans out there. They would love the Justice Party and what we're trying to accomplish. They might disagree on one or two issues that we, but we're with the majority of people and we're trying to strengthen our representative democracy. We're trying to preserve and bring back our republic. Well, I I wanted to point that out because, you know, that was part of what intrigued me when you approached me for uh, some funding that I didn't have to leave the Democratic Party to, uh, uh, to help get the discussion back to where it ought to be. Well, before we leave, I want to uh, ask anyone that has watched this program to please go into our YouTube channel at uh, Conversations with David Ibarra and subscribe to our channel. And with that, it comes to our end of our conversation. And Rocky, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. Good to see you.